Well, a DBR here. Uh, welcome to Hammondville Horror. Thank you for visiting. I'm Clint. I am Don. And today we have a very, very special guest. And and I truly mean that. We have Mr. Tom McLaughlin with us today. You know, Tom, I want to say that um, walking into this um, and preparing for it, I thought basically, all right, we're going to talk about, you know, uh, Friday the 13th, part six. And, and we're going to talk about, you know, the uh, Friday the 13th fan films that, that we're real familiar with, you know, like Vengeance and Vengeance 2, you know, and but I, I don't like to half ass it. I kind of like to do a little bit of research into somebody before I talk to them. And the more I looked at, the more interesting you became. I mean, you have had a pretty like, I don't know, an exciting life, you know, from somebody, you know, standing outside of it. I mean, I know it's, it's your life. You, you're living it. But I mean it's fucking crazy if you're if you're you know from from my perspective it's like uh it's like holy shit um you know uh, growing up and you know cutting class to go watch you know um uh, universal monster movies in a local theater you know to uh hammer those are hammer, for... those are hammer horror films oh hammer films oh I'm yeah hammer nice. films and, gotta... and roger corman movies yeah, all the universals were on tv that i i got gotcha. yeah well, my memory is not as good as, as as it once was just a couple of years ago. So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, to, um, you know, opening up for uh, really famous acts uh, uh, on Sunset, you know, uh, to going to see like a Marcel Marceau show and talking to him afterwards and then going the fuck over to France to like attend his school. I mean, it's like it just the whole thing just sounds like a ride. I mean, uh and it but still is. You, it's, it's, you're like, yeah, man, it's just something I wanted to do. So I went out and did it. I mean, uh, that's uh, and I have a lot of respect for that. I think that's really cool. Um, and that's not really a question, but no, uh, that was just, you know, you're a bad <laughs> motherfucker. That's what I got out of it. Yeah. Um, that's really super cool. I, yeah. I think the best quote somebody said is, is like, you know, you're like fucking Forrest Gump. I mean, it's like you seem to always be someplace where something's happening, whether it was being front row center at the Monterey Pop Festival, watching Hendrix for the first time, Janice, Jimmy. I mean, it was just amazing. And we were like 15, 16 year olds, you know, that managed to get these seats. And, you know, that changed my life, of course, in terms of rock and roll. Um, before that, it was all like movies. And that's really what I wanted to do is be a filmmaker because my dad went to USC film school and they wouldn't hire film students in those days. So you guys that are going to film school, it's a whole different world now than it was like film school. Are you kidding? You're not going to learn anything there. So he, he went out and got a regular job, but bought a house right next to the MGM studio. So he'd be close to it. So as I was a kid, I got to use the back lots to make my little eight millimeter movies. So I got the benefit of something that unfortunately he didn't get to fulfill. Right. But that was the beginning of my like, yeah, I want to make movies and bring my friends in. We sneak under the fence on the weekends and shoot these things and these incredible sets, you know, that we had to play on. So, I mean, things like that, it's just sort of like you kind of just kind of fall into these things. And we did a battle of the bands at one point, I guess it was like 60, 65, 66. You guys have to check your facts about what years that was, but it was before the Doors album came out and we were in a battle of the band with the Doors and they won. We came in second, but had no idea what was going to happen, you know, with an act like that, that yeah. they would become as legendary as they were. And we ended up opening for them a number of times, as well as Pink Floyd and blue cheer and of oh, iron butterfly and the animals and just all these bands that would come in but we were like 15 16 year old kids that somehow the clubs didn't card us so we got to you know <laughs> go in and play at these places so it really kind of was that you know somehow just being at the right place at the right time when like, yeah. the music scene was just really changing at that point it sounds made up, if I'm being honest. It, you know, yeah, it if, sounds if like a, we were a sitting at a, a bar getting drunk right now. I'd be mm -hmm. turning to the person next to me saying, "This guy's a fucking pathological liar." Like, this, I know. No way this happened. You know. You know <laughs> that's been my that's been my greatest fear in life. Is that I'm going to be one of those guys. You know, sitting there. <laughs> you know what I did? Hey, 
You know what I fucking did when I was. What do you mean, shut up? Fuck you. Right. you know, but thank God, uh, Bill Madri wrote a book called A Strange Idea of Entertainment. He took my line yeah. from Friday. And basically, uh, my best man from uh, my wedding uh, did the uh, foreword, and he just named off all these weird ass connections who else you know that smoked weed with Hendrix who else you know that opened for the doors who else you know that... and he just went down all this stuff and it's like I don't know anybody of you well here he is you know and then I can kind of you know answer all these questions from Joe who had seen all my work all the films all the episodes the shows or whatever and put together all these questions so you know it's all there and either you know, you believe it or you don't. And I dedicated it to God, who has a great sense of humor. And I'm here, I guess, as a proof of it. That, <laughs> you know, one lame ass couldn't stay in high school because of long hair. And I was in a band kicked out of seven high schools. You know, now I'm a teaching professor at Chapman University Dodge College because of the stuff I've done, not because I've certainly got any credits. But that school, that's what they use is, is people like John Badham and you know, major, major people in the business who have learned it by doing yeah. it. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's great, you know, to be able to kind of pass on, you know, what it is that, you know, and yeah. always saying to these kids, look, I'm not going to teach you anything. I'm going to hopefully inspire you, give you some ideas, hopefully yep. that you can take, or it'll get in the back of that lizard brain of yours. And when you're going to be on a set, you're going to go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's something I remember. Oh yeah. And it'll be something maybe I've said, 20 years ago that will suddenly, you know, pop out of your head. Yeah. But it's about you guys coming up with stuff and influencing each other and working together and go off like Carpenter did with, you know, his little core of people from mm -hmm. USC to make Halloween. Speaking of which, there it is. That's no a Friday bad ass it. shirt, dude. That is a so, wicked shirt. I know. I just saw this the other day. On, uh, I think it was on um, Cavities called the cavities or no, something like that i get so many different shirts i, forget yeah, all I know them. i know which one you're talking about yeah it's it's amazing and you know what clint he's gonna be it's like the the 20 the 203 38 uh degrees of tom is what that is everybody's linked to tom it's like <laughs> kevin bacon so yeah, right and and you know it, it's amazing that you've had the life that you've had and and um you know to kind of kick it into gear with with your films and your episodes that you've made um we were actually talking off mic about one that um, not a lot of people know about, which is one dark night, um, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. 1982 and something that we wanted to ask, you know, before we get into that one, because it was, it was a, a, a and obviously 82, a, a rated PG horror movie. That was kind of like, what the fuck? What is that? That doesn't exist. No. And we didn't want it to exist either. That was a really strange quirk of fate. Right. Um, so Clint mentioned something on a post that we had on our, our Facebook group um, about Fulci could have could have done that. That looked like something that it, Lucio Fulci did. It had a feel to it that really reminded me it of, of Fulci. My, you know, minus, you know, this, the excess amount of gore and things like that. There was just there was just a darkness and, and to a real creepy factor to it, you know, and and it was really only after. You know, they were locked in, you know, the mausoleum and the coffins started coming out of the walls. You know what I mean? It's like that really spoke to me. And that like just woke up one of those childhood fears of mine. I'm like, shit, this is like the thing that I would have been deathly afraid of when I was about, you know, 12 years old, you know. Yeah. Um, and that was and I don't know where any influences like that may have came from. I know you've you've spoken about like uh like uh, parallel thinking, you know, with uh, other creators, yeah, you know, where it's like you all seem to kind of come up with uh, similar ideas, like around the same time, you know. Um, and I didn't yeah. know if your feelings yeah. on it, yeah. Well, even even worse with that one, which uh, I mean, I'll try to do a condensed backstory because you know, as they say, it's all in the book. For if anybody wants to hear the FM version that goes on and on, I'll I'll try to give you the AM version, which is quick spurts of, of it, but. Um, uh, uh, Dario, um, oh God, what's his name? Uh, just one, right uh, no, no, um, uh, uh, DP, um, Dario, 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 oh, shit, I can't think of his last name, but anyway, he shot ET, oh. and he was a friend of our DP, and he came in when we were editing, and he was looking at you know the sequence with the 
the corpse is coming out and all that stuff. And um, he turned to me and he said, when do you guys plan on releasing this? And I said, oh, you know, we're going to have it out, you know, probably in a couple of months. He goes, oh, good, because um, I saw some cut footage of this, of the other film that Spielberg's doing right now, Poltergeist. And it's got kind of a little similar vibe there with the, there's a pool. Well, I don't want to tell you too much about, but there's a pool sequence with corpses and stuff. Right, right. Um, and uh, so as fate would have it, I mean, we, we, you know, did that movie in 81 and it didn't come out, you know, until I think January of 83 or something. Oh, God. Um, so Poltergeist had come and gone. So most of the critics were like, well, you know, obviously they saw Poltergeist and went off and just did their own version of it and stuff, which, what can you do? I mean, obviously that idea was sort of there to happen. I could see only as many things of the uh, Italian horror films as that were released in, you know, like the low end theaters, yep. you know, where they would have like a triple bill and there'd be one of those on there that you could see. But most of all that influence all just came from, you know, Gothic horror in general, uh, what Universal was doing, obviously what, um, you know, the, the Hammer films were doing, you know, more brightly lit. And we were trying to go for a much more, you know, darker, spooky thing. And that influence was because when I went to Paris in 1970, I went down into the catacombs and I walked along those corridors and in those days they just gave you a candle and you were with a little group but i decided in my little lizard brain i'm gonna move away from the group and just go by myself and see where this where you know what happens well for the first time ever in my life boys i got supernatural fear i just got that sense of okay skulls and bones thousands and thousands of them they're not they're not gonna do anything to me it's not like it but you still felt this you know literally the old hair on the back of yep. the neck go. I never had that experience, and that, of course, stuck with me. And when I came back to the States, I started thinking, how could I make a movie off of that? You know, because there's something about that that really got to me. And I was working at the Disney Studios um, on the Black Hole you know, as a choreographer, you know, for the robots and the sentries, and then ended up being Captain Star in the thing. And I went across one the street one day to Forest Lawn and saw one of the mausoleums, and it kind of all went, whoop. Well, what about, you know, corpses behind the marble and they have to come out some way. I got to figure that out and somebody trapped in there. So that's kind of where it all came together. And then the rest of it was just, you know, all those influences of not just myself, but Tom Berman, who had these corpses, you know, and we wanted to, I wanted this idea of keeping them dead, you know, so they floated instead of walked because I felt that was, you know, too much George Romero. So, you know, tried to put as many things in it. And also my study of the psychic sciences, the whole thing about being a psychic vampire and that he would feed off of these young girls, leave the bodies, take the energy, levitate things, make things move. And now he's dead, but that energy still in him. And obviously it sets off this, you know, chain of events yep. with oh, yeah, all, yeah. All people coming out and scaring the girls even more, which empowered him, you know, a lot more. I love yeah. it. I love it. It's and it's, it yeah. was a movie that I never, I didn't really like think about watching until I, I read it, and I was like, "Oh my god, I know that guy's name." I'm watching this, and it was that's what it was. That that movie has such a feeling of dread, like the shots of you know just pitch black, just darkness, and then watching them come out of it. It's like, like Clint said, that's the shit that scares you. That's that's your childhood fear, especially getting locked in a, a funeral parlor or a mausoleum as a kid. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fuck that. No, <laughs> no, that's that. No, that is not something I need to experience in my, my lifetime. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great movie and, and we, we highly recommended it on our group. Um, Cause it's, it's, it's very, it's very unique without a doubt. It's a very slow build. Uh, I mean, and that's what the movie's, used to be i mean all those movies that i saw you know in in the 50s and 60s um you know took a lot of time to kind of set up a premise and set up characters and things and you know mm -hmm. kind of give you just a little taste that, of something to come that mm -hmm. that's something that hopefully would keep you in your seat and you wouldn't go to the bathroom and go get popcorn or something and then once all hell broke loose then it's less like pedal to the metal for the rest of it and you know one of my favorite stories is i i got um, the, the film was accepted at a French horror film festival 
whatever that was, the, some, some, you know, 84, maybe 85, somewhere in there. But the first night I arrived, um, my movie wasn't showing, but a guy, you know, this wonderful guy named Sam Raimi had a movie called Evil Dead. And that was showing. And guys, this crowd was in French, was chanting blood, blood, blood. I mean, hundreds of people, blood, blood. Firecrackers were going, you know, being thrown from the balcony, exploding. I've never seen an audience this insane. And of course that movie just, they went crazy. Yep. And when it was over and Sam was walking up the aisle, you know, you know, like hordes, okay, we're putting a statue in the park for Mr. Rainey's, you know. <laughs> I knew from that moment on, you know, this guy like had something that was, cutting edge, something we'd not seen before. And of course, the next night I had to get up there and do my thing. Um, and I was like going, okay, all right, it, you know, it's it's a slow build, guys. I, because I just knew, you know, they were going to be expecting, you know, the, mm -hmm. ne the next American film to have that. And it was appreciated. The ending got incredible results, but I could just feel myself going, you know, squirming that this was, you know, kind of out of time with where, you know, horror had gotten, but yeah. here was the interesting thing is the, is the PG thing. We th somehow in our thinking now, granted the movie was paid for by Mormon investors. And that was like, we could, for two years, we couldn't get it sold. Everybody wanted to do a slasher movie. I didn't want to do a slasher movie because everyone was doing the slasher movie. Um, so I, you know, I held on to this idea of no, this is going to have like, you know, dead corpses and maggots and pus and all this stuff. And it's going to be pressing against the wind. It's going to gross you out. You know, I thought for sure, you know, we would get an R just on that. Any of the profanity that we had in the movie, we had to take out because the Mormons asked us to take out the couple of times, which was only a couple of times. They only would say fuck or, you know, you, you know, you're right. some bitch or whatever. Yeah. So that was no problem. And it had no sex because the story just it was about the girls yeah. talking mm -hmm. the other girl. And as a result, you know, the MPA looked at it and went, PG. And I was like going, wait, 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 <laughs> wait a minute. You're OK. Oh, no, this is great compared to all these Friday the 13th and things where they just, you know. <laughs> so it goes out with this PG. And I thought, OK, let's see what happens. Well, grandmothers and parents because their kids said, it's PG, mom, can we go? You know, or, you know, grandma's in charge this weekend. What do you want to go see? This. Okay, let's go. And I scared the shit out of them by the time they got to the end of the movie. So that all these years, people would go, you have no idea, dude, what you did. I was under a bed, man, for a week. You know, I was like eight years old. And that fucked me up, you know. <laughs> Guarantee and, it. I bet you know, it did. A number of people said, you know, I'm in this film industry because that movie had such an effect on me. And I said, well, Exorcist did that to me. When after I saw that, I went, I've got to find some some idea that's going to make audiences do what I saw was happening in that theater, you know, when Exorcist opened. Yeah. So it's it's interesting how Very. Like that became, you know, kind of a backward, you know, success in that it, it hit a lot of kids as the yeah. Wicked Witch of the West did, you know, in in uh, Wizard of Oz. Right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. And again, you know, back then, PG was different than it is now. I mean, um, you know, and I always bring up like Back to the Future, like no, obviously no sex or nothing like that, but profanity, you know, Back to the yeah. Future, you know, you said, well, you know, holy shit, you know, and all everything like that. And that stuck with a PG rating. So, you know, it's just funny how the, the rating board is with uh with some stuff and you know, speaking of, of, you know, the, the MP double a, um, mm -hmm. you know, we'll obviously get into to Friday the 13th part six, but again, like, like Clint said, we do our research, man. We try to, we try to talk about things that not everybody talks about constantly. Mm -hmm. Um, so one, one thing that, that we were talking about again off mic was, uh, sometimes they come back, mm -hmm. um, you know, TV movie, obviously adaptation, Stephen King. Um, you know, how do you feel about that one? Did you, did you get your you know, point across, did you do what you wanted to do with that one? Or, you know, how'd you feel about it? Wow. That is, that was kind of a turning point, uh, mainly in my life as that happened. Um, I was at a point where for whatever reason, so many things, both personal and career wise all happened literally, you know, within that same few months, uh, my father was dying of cancer. So I was trying to deal with that because, you know, he was my, you know, my mentor, why I got into the movies. 
my daughter was about to be born. So I'm dealing with my wife. This is our second child. And we knew it was a girl. And there was all that sort of emotional connection. Mick Garris and I had been approached by Universal to create two series based on like titles that they had. You know, one of them that we just loved and we wanted to run with was American Werewolf in London, then found out that no, Polygram actually owns that title, not Universal. So we went back in, found She Wolf of London, said, okay, we're going to do that. And then I found another one. It came from outer space. And I somehow had this crazy idea what if these were kind of two wild and crazy guys who were in a Corvette who were going, driving around America, but they're actually aliens and, but they're not very bright. You know, there's a bit of that, you know, Bill and Ted aspect to them, which is what television does. You know, you repeat something in the movies that was successful. Yep. So we had to find 20 writers for the one series, 20 writers for the other, 20 directors and 20 directors again. One was being done in England, the other one was being done here. So we were, you know, hopping the globe trying to do that. My best friend, I had directed a uh, comedy play that he did in San Francisco that was picked up by Disney and Showtime. And it was a five camera comedy, you know, special that you know we were shooting for Disney during that same time. So I'm prepping that, casting all the rest of that. And then Dino brought me, you know, sometimes they come back. That script just didn't quite work. It didn't have all the family elements and things that I felt a Stephen King piece really needed to have that sort of internal thing that it's so great because in his writings, you hear how people think and it, you can't really do that on the screen. Mm -hmm. So you have to somehow visualize it other ways or start as we did with some narration that Jim Matheson was doing to kind of take us into it. Um, and all of this was happening simultaneously. So I didn't know where I was, you know, where, where, what am I right. casting? <laughs> yeah. And, oh, and sometimes they come back as being done in Kansas purely because the production designer's wife was leaving him and going to Kansas because she was sick of Hollywood. And if you want to make movies, you got to move, make them there. So that's where we went, but turned out to be a beautiful place to, sh to shoot this kind of a movie because mm -hmm. it was middle America. Yeah. Uh, so my father passed on, my daughter was born, finished Stephen's show or was in the middle of Stephen's show when my father passed. So I had to go to the funeral, do the eulogy, come back and then direct the show that night and, you know, get on a plane the next morning and off to Kansas. And Mick and I had, you know, found enough producer, um, writers and directors to do the shows. So when I hit Kansas, I didn't know where I was. I hadn't grieved for my father yet and just had to kind of put everything into, all right, I'm here, I'm going to do this. And this show was cursed, guys. For whatever reason, every day something went wrong that was completely like weird left field kinds of stuff. People you know, falling down and getting hurt. It seemed like there was an ambulance on the set every other day. The first day of shooting, we had planned everything for this exterior shots. That morning, I get a call at four in the morning from my AD saying, look out the window. No, I don't want to look out. Look out the window. I look out the window. It's like, you know, <laughs> almost three feet of snow. And we had just heard snow never happens till January. And this was November. So, you know, we had to, we had to move away the snow, do one little scene on the porch. Uh, and that was the end of the first day. So we're already behind the day, day one. And this happened day after Brooke Adams twisted her ankle, couldn't work for a couple of days. We had to keep taking insurance thing. So what was a little like 27, 28 day shoot went into like 36 days. That's bad on any low budget movie for a so-called TV movie. You know, we should have been all fired. Mm -hmm. But, you know, would call me and say, Doc, you give me a goddamn good picture. And I said, oh, yes, sir. All right, keep going. You know, I didn't have to have the phone back to the producers, you know, because yeah. he's the one that has to deal with the monies and stuff. We had an actor who played, I don't know if you guys saw the movie, but there was an elderly actor. Yeah, I saw it. Who was the one that says, you know, he has a whole sermon about, you know, the whole backstory of this and what happened. And, you know, sometimes they come back. Mm -hmm. And he was like an old retired stuntman. He wanted to do this part. That he lived next door to the producer. So I said, sure, why not? You know, he goes, oh, he's so happy. He's been dying to do something. So a day before we we're, two days before we were about to shoot, he has a massive heart attack. So I said, all right, 
you know, then we've got to recast. I mean, we've got to find somebody here in Kansas. We get, you know, and the producer says, no, no, he wants to do it. He's got, I said, are you kidding me? Man, had to, they put him on a plane. They brought this guy, <laughs> you know, he had, you know, needle in his arm, the bag next to him and stuff. And of course, the poor guy could not remember the line. So Tim Matheson was holding these huge, you know, cue cards in front of him. And yeah. the guy basically just did the piece, you know, reading the words and got through it. And it was like, oh, my God, you know, that it, it was great because he was so feeble and things, you know, it actually really worked for the part. So we thought we were home free. No, the crew had loaded in daytime the film into, you know, what was lit for night. And the whole thing was like washed out, fucked. And it was like, oh, you know, we got to reshoot. No, we can't reshoot. We can't bring it back again. So through the miracle, what technology we had in those days, my uh, editor and I just did as much tweaking, you know, with video as we possibly could and got it to look as good as we could do it. And then sort of fucked up the last couple of shots of the previous scene and they <laughs> going into the next scene. So it's sort of, Blended. blended yep wow and again holy shit <laughs> that's I feel all, like I, yeah. up, I feel like that was the wrong question to ask hey, about that fuck fucking movie i'm like do, i feel horrible now <laughs> like that can of worms holy shit <laughs> oh my god and, and then at the very end last day some guy comes up to me and goes uh so how's your shooting going and i go fine and he goes yeah well, you're on uh indian burial ground right here you know and i go oh Right. He goes, no, no, seriously, this where this tunnel is, where the train goes through, this was all like burial ground that they tore tore up and put the tunnel in here. And a lot of weird things have happened. Nothing weird happened with you? Nope. Uh, <laughs> nope. So eventually really? that story, nope. you know, went to Stephen King, uh, which I thought was great because, uh, you know, we, we, we got through basically <laughs> a cursed movie. And to tell you the truth, the music um, that Terry Plummeri put in there, it has so much like heart and and warmth and everything I think I was feeling about my daughter coming into the world and my losing my father and thing somehow all got in there despite all the trouble and problems. Tim brought it, you know, Brooke brought it. Everybody was just so great. Robert Russler and those the guys as the as the evil, you know, you know, I don't know what you call them, ghosts. You know, walking <laughs> forth, whatever you know they were just i mean they had me laughing hysterically because they were just so badass and so right on with what they were doing um so yeah it all like came together and i keep you know getting letters and lots of times when i'm at these conventions people come up with the posters and stuff and and when i was in germany it was like a huge hit there was a whole book on it over there and it was again amazing you have no idea you know when you make something what happens to that movie as it you know it goes down the years right yeah well speaking of which mm -hmm. that brings us to the the coup de gras if you <laughs> would say so friday the 13th part six speaking of films that you would never know would go oh, yeah. where they go yeah. um i can without a shadow of a doubt tell you this is my favorite friday the 13th without a doubt thank you and <laughs> I love everything about it. I love CJ Graham's performance as Jason. Um, you know, he's, he's amazing the way that he moves. Um, and you weren't, and he didn't want to make a slasher. So it's funny that, you know, you made a slasher. Um, but it's so it's, but again, this one's so different feeling that it didn't feel like your normal Friday the 13th. And, mm. you know, the fact that it, it took place after five, you know, that, uh, you know, the whole red herring with, with Roy, it wasn't really Jason, you know, you were like, Oh shit. Well, now we're really going to get to see what happens. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. so I know you've been asked the question a bajillion times, but just one more time. Okay. Explain us how this came into existence. Um, well, as you just said, uh, the fans were really pissed on part five, you know, they were really expecting this incredible comeback and, uh, you know, for one, it wasn't Jason at the end of the day. And two, the last images were of Tommy Jarvis with the mask. And now the thought was, so Jason's dead and the next Jason's going to be Tommy. I'm sorry. So that, you know, was a huge problem mm -hmm. uh, with, with the with the blowback. It still did well. People still came to see it. And of course, why it even happened at all was because 
the final chapter made so much money. It's like, you know, we're not done with milk on this lemon yet. I mean, there's, mm-hmm. there's definitely still more juice here. So they rationalize, well, what if it's not Jason? And, and, you know, the audience gets fooled just like we didn't know at the beginning of the first Friday, you know, figuring the killer, you know, had to be a guy. It's like, whoa, it's his you know, mother. It's a woman. Oh my God. And she was just so badass, you know, uh, Betsy Palmer, just great, great. So oh, yeah. they reach out to me and normally things are done every two years. And they reached out to me one year, you know, after it was out, because it's like, we've got to get this thing back. And they saw one dark night and, you know, Frank said, Frank Mancuso Jr., who was in charge of all those things at Paramount, said, I love to look at this. I would love, you know, see what you could do with this thing. And I said, quite honestly, you know, I'm not a huge fan of just, you know, cutting up women, you know, for the joy of having people in the crowd go, yeah, get that bitch, you know, because that's what I would see when I did go. Right. (laughs) And, you know, and he said, well, all we need is for you to bring back Jason from the dead. And I said, and what else? That's it. Could I put comedy in it? What do you mean? Could I make the characters like likable and humorous and maybe even sort of know about Jason? And it's like, ooh, Jason, and, and don't take it seriously? He goes, yeah, but you're not going to make fun of Jason. I said, no, nope, he's going to be more powerful. I mean, think Terminator, Jason. I mean, yeah. more than anything else. Um, I have tried to defend myself about it. It's not zombie Jason, but I it's a, it's a <laughs> battle it's a bit, I'm ever going to yeah. win. No. You know, but I stole from obviously Frankenstein right. and I said that up front and I put make it car loss market that you see in the background you know I refer to Carpenter Cunningham all this so this whole thing is sort of a valentine yep. to the universal horror movies and just kind of taking a slasher movie and saying what if this guy was so powerful he doesn't need to slice throats and stuff he can twist heads off he can punch hearts out he can bend you backwards he can slob off three heads at once not just so I made all the kills like superhuman so that they're not imitatable, which was also kind of going on in the, at that time. It's like, you know, we're showing these kids who already have issues, things that they can now rationalize, you know, yep. put some you know, Rob Zombie music there and, and some Metallica and give them a knife and they're going to create hell. And I was like, bullshit. Yeah, right. you know, there are certain people that, yeah, certain things is going to be the gasoline, but the fire's already there. Yep. And I felt I'm going to make this like a, a roller coaster ride. This is going to be a ride. It's a movie. It's a ride. You know, it's not to be taken seriously, except if you go into a fun house or like what I did last night going into mazes, you didn't know what was going to be around the next corner. And when they were creative, you suddenly went from World War II and dead soldiers and stuff to suddenly you know, you're in a dance hall with a bunch of like, you know, people da- dancing with dead bodies, like, whoa, that's cool. Mm-hmm. And you felt like you were in this nightmare. And to me, that's what I tried to, do, tried to do with this is make us like the kids, give Jason an agenda for the first time, which is he was happy being dead. Frankenstein was happy being dead, as right. was Dracula, as was the wolf man. And they all lamented for why am I out here killing people? I don't want to do this. To me, I looked at Jason as like he was peaceful and the Magus were having a great feast on him. And suddenly this kid comes and gets pissed off and a lightning bolt hits and now he's back. And all he wants is to kill that kid and anything in his way. In his way. So he's got an agenda. And Tommy, of course, realizes he fucked up. He's trying to tell the sheriff and everybody, we got to get him you know, and of course, the sheriff believes he's doing it because he's this wacky kid out of this institution. Mm-hmm. So they both had agendas. And at the end, you know, Megan jumped in there as the woman has to and helped her man. And, you know, you you basically put Jason, you know, back down in the lake, which I thought was important to kind of have a a circular thing. You know, the the poltergeist thing of you remove the tombstones, but you didn't remove the bodies. You know, you have to put the dead back where they're supposed to be. And that's sort of that iconic image of him, you know, hanging there. And I see that so many places and people put it down in lakes. And I think I went, wow, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah. You know, that that happened that way. Or get little miniatures for their fish tanks. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. I know. <laughs> it's amazing, guys. It's just, you know, when something like that happens, you, you, uh, I really thought, as most of us did in the 80s, you're going to make a movie. It'll play one week for the people that want to see it. Second week for the people who told other friends to go see it. And then third week, you know, 
out in the boonies someplace, the drive-in, the third film on the drive-in, all of that, and then it's gone. You know, yeah. that there was no DVDs and any of that yet. And so it when it started, you know, with suddenly, wait a minute, beta VHS, and then obviously into in, into the um vertical laser discs and you know, and on and on until now, obviously it's streaming, push a button, get anything you want, you know, yep. kind of thing. But that's what made all these things so successful is so many people saw them as, you know, young kids at home. Somebody got a hold of a, you know, a, a VHS tape and brought it over at midnight yep. and the kids jumped out of the windows of their bedrooms and gathered together and saw these. So they had that same kind of sense of forbidden that I had when I would ditch school and go to this theater and see these noon screenings of Roger Corman, you know, Vincent Price movies or Hammer Horror movies and things. It's like, you're not supposed to be doing this. And it just really made the experience wonderful, you know, <laughs> because it was just, you're already in fear of getting caught, but yep. now you're watching something that's also scary. And so it it's had this longevity that I never imagined that, you know, we'd be sitting here, three of us talking about this now, 36 years later. Yeah. Uh, and every year there's new fans, you know, that, you know, happen to see it, you know, maybe might have seen one of them years ago and then kind of takes them back and looks at the other ones. And people always, for some weird reason, call me mine the sort of, um, what's the term, uh, entry drug. You know, <laughs> it's like, if you've never seen one, see this. Yes. It's yeah. more like a movie movie, you know, with yeah. characters and things. And it's not just about the sex. In fact, there's only one sex scene. And, yep. and Darkin said she didn't want to take off her top. I said, fine, probably would cut the comedy because I know what I'd be looking at. Damn right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it was no big deal. But then, of course, I got a lot of backflat, you know, for that. But, you know, to me, it was like, you know, if we have so-called rules, all right. Certainly vampires and werewolf rules have changed so much over the years. Yeah, no shit. Sure. You know, it doesn't have to be have sex and die, you know, um, even though that's exactly what happened with these guys. But I wanted the humor of the, you know, the motor home and Jason looking yep. at it the way Michael Myers does, you know, that that tilt. And, you know, you steal from the best. That's what you do when you put it all yep. together and you mix it up. And it worked because it had all these other layers of both comedy, car chase, underwater kids, which never had been done before. And yep. people are uh, you're going to kill one of these kids. It's like, oh, you have to wait and see, you know, and like there's a relief that it didn't happen. But at the same time, it made the, you know, the tension a little greater by putting in these, these elements. So yeah. it was like a happy accident in a lot of ways. And I very proud of it after all this many years that so many people really, really identify with it as like a period of their life, you know, that, that was really great, you know, when they saw it. Raising my hand. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I agree with everything you just said, especially with, with the entry point. I mean, you took, you took a franchise that was kind of, you know, we had the final chapter, which obviously we know wasn't the final chapter. Um, mm -hmm. you know, when you, you kind of started the, it was like the new era of Jason, you know, like you said, the resurrected Jason, mm -hmm. you know, he goes from being, you know, obviously in, in the final chapter, he's a lot more human, you know, he gets his, he gets his hand cut. You know, and then when they hit him with the machete, he slides down. You can see everything, and and you know this one, it didn't even have like a, a ton of gore. And obviously, I know why. That is the MPWA absolutely raped this movie. Nine, yeah, nine screenings we had from the 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 one for One Dark Night to nine on this thing. And you might have heard this already, but the thing they picked on more than anything else that kind of was more the like the seventh, eighth, the ninth time we had to go in was the back bend scene. Yep. That doesn't have one drop of blood, nope. you know, and they just objected to it in the how much, you know, how it, it, by this point we just had enough, you know, and, and so I ended up cutting out, you know, one bend and him pushing one cut of that and, you know, they let it go. So, and any of the outtakes or, or stuff that wasn't used is, I mean, trims. I mean, I was just trimming one frame at a time right. and send it back and hope that somebody else from that committee would look at it and miss that and focus on something else. So there wasn't a whole lot. But the few things that did get taken out of there when he squishes the cop's head and you actually saw the the skull crack and a piece of the brain come up and a little bit of blood. It just was, it was subtle, but it was yeah. cool, you know, and the, with the sound. 
and you actually saw all three heads go, you know, simultaneously. These guys had rigged a thing that was just incredible, you know, that that was I hated to see go. So, I mean, little things like that along the way we lost, but no full on, you know, kill that had yeah. to be completely, you know, cut out. Right. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, it was a hell of a lot of fun. And and I know that, um, you know, every Friday the 13th fan has their own list of their favorite movies. Yeah, and and the thing that I and they're all different. But everything that I hear time and time again is like that one somewhere in the top, you know, like three or four of, of everybody's lists. And 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 that's the reason why. I mean, it gave you a story. Um, it, it took you on a ride. You know, it gave you things you hadn't seen before. You know, um, the other one I hear kind of with it is kind of like number four. Yeah. Like, that's my favorite. Was a big favorite for a lot of people. Yeah. Four's, four's yeah. Four. Yeah. So I thought that was like, you know, that's the Joe Zito did a great job and that whole idea that this, okay, this is all going to come to a conclusion here. Yeah. And I thought they did it well. Unlike mm -hmm. Halloween ends, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was going to ask, you're not alone. Yeah, you're ends. not alone there. Holy shit. Um, yeah, that, I just, that to me, it's like I sat there going, well, this is a good little horror movie, you know, as it went on. Uh, but who's the guy on the poster that I thought we were supposed to see an hour in here? <laughs> you know, uh, just yeah, a lot of stuff that I just don't understand, and I could see why fans like rose up and said, you know, we're petitioning, we want a new ending shot. You know, that's not the way you know Michael should go out here and stuff. And I definitely get that because it, I think they really switched from kills to ends where he was superhuman, and every time he killed somebody, he got more powerful. To now he's this old guy. You know that he can get his mask taken off and yeah, he got his ass kicked by some fucking kid like hey yeah. punch you in the face i'm gonna steal your mask like yeah uh, and what? Then what jamie did to him was no different than a hundred other people have done to him over the years yeah. why this time did it work you know my girlfriend who's an avid 80s horror fan she sort of just kind of excused it as like well no he's re he really is human and i go well it wasn't on the last one yeah I mean, what are we supposed to believe here yeah no you so, yeah it's like i love i love, I love hearing that from you of all fucking people that I've listened to, hearing it from you is amazing. The director, writer, producer of, of part six saying that is fucking, it is golden. I love it. Well, you got to realize too, man. I, I saw that ha Halloween, the original Halloween in a theater on a Friday night. I went because I was uh, going to this film school uh, called Sherwood Oaks Experimental College. And um, Carpenter who had done, I guess he had done the, the uh, what was that name of that uh, space thing he did at USC? Um, I'm blanking on the name of that one now. But, I know what you're talking about, yeah. Um, I'll think of it when I stop thinking. But anyway, he came to the class and he gave notes on a little short horror thing I did called uh, Ouija. And, uh, you know, there was a thing where this girl was chasing me around because, you know, you always starred in your own things and those, and those things. And like she had this huge knife and she tried to hit me and ended up going just right between my crotch. And after when it was over, Carpenter said, I got a question. Was that a real knife? I said, yeah, yeah, it was. And he goes, don't do that. Don't do that. That's a huge <laughs> mistake. You know, and I went, oh, and he goes, yeah, get a fake one. I said, but they're going to look fake. Not if you move it fast. No, yeah. But I appreciate it. Dan O'Bannon was teaching the editing class, you know, who was, you know, went off to do uh, you know, aliens. I guess he did the first uh, script on alien with Ron Chuzette and, dead and buried and things and so when halloween was opening it was sort of like okay i want to check out carpenter's movie because you know i kind of knew him from there and guys the theater i mean it the air was filled with popcorn constantly every jump scare people were up out of their seats yelling screaming I, you really did feel like you were on a ride and i went holy shit i gotta come back tomorrow and see you know the same thing again so that that and of course exorcist are the two ones that i always bring up Yep. Because the audience made you feel like this was an event, you know. And of course, I followed them. I've seen everyone, you know, religiously and, you know, have the things I like about them and what I don't. And just like the fan films now, they're doing the Friday stuff. I'll always try to reach out to these guys if I can and say, here's what I thought was really great. And I compliment you guys for keeping the franchise going when the big boys don't seem to know when they're going to end it and right. how much money they really want. Um, but you're doing it. You're doing something we've never had in cinema where the fans are paying for other fans to make the movies. I, you know, that's incredible. We'll mm -hmm. 
20 years from now, there'll be festivals of these movies, you know, and it's like, yeah, first time I saw this thing, and it'll be just like with the Fridays and stuff. You saw it at home, you saw it on YouTube, yep. you saw it for free, you know, and get you like it, you don't like it, you know, there's all those opinions too with those. But I thought, you know, this is just very cool, you know, from the standpoint of yeah. film and the experience of stuff that you love. Definitely. Um, Definitely. Yeah. And me and Clint have brought it up numerous times that at some point or another, indie and Hollywood is good. They're going to intersect. They're going to yeah. have to there be just because it's, I just think it's inevitable. And, and it's funny because leading into that, you know, obviously vengeance, vengeance to bloodlines, um, you know, you play mm -hmm. Walt, um, yeah. you know, so, I mean, that experience with Jason Brooks, I mean, what he brought to the table, um, I mean, it, it's, absolutely ridiculous and i'm sure and i, th I think I, was, I listened to in an interview you had ideas about this did you not you know coming up with his dad still being around and well stuff this, like yeah this is this is a tricky thing to answer in that um the the first director jeremy uh contacted me and said they were doing this movie and they wanted to use the idea of jason's father which i didn't use in mind but anybody who's a fan knows it was in the little novella book that they had um it was talked about we did a extras feature where they took the storyboards and actually got old martin to do the voice and stuff so you got a chance to sort of see what it could have been and it's a small little introduction and i actually envisioned uh jason's father more like raymar from one dark night you know much more uh, Sengali esque with the hair back and and things and CJ was great because okay. again the long hair and the long coat and stuff but you know he obviously was like Jason because he was so it almost that father son thing kind of you know was very cool so I said yeah take it run with it I couldn't do it you guys if you can get away with it do it and then they you know they sent me the script and asked for notes and things and there were so many references to my film I said guys I can't you know if this is what you want to do please don't put my name on it don't say that I helped in any way because it it, it looks like me going oh yeah you got to put this in because I did this you know this is yours you make right. it you know so I went up and did the scene with CJ, which was great fun, you know, that that opened vengeance. And when I saw the movie, I thought, boy, they just, they went overboard with the gore and the tits, everything they could possibly think of. And, you know, I'm was sure it was going to do well. And ever since, obviously, Never Hiked Alone that uh, Vincent DeSante did, there's been a lot of different ones. You know, he did a nice clean version of it that to me wasn't my Jason, but certainly you know, hack, you know, there was stuff that obviously the influence was there. Mm -hmm. And he invited me to the screening to see my reaction, particularly see Tom Matthews and I go, holy shit. You know, I go, well, there goes some of my sequel idea with Tom and Megan, but okay, <laughs> got there first. Right. You know, that's the way it is. And then all the other ones, you know, Jason Rising recently, I thought was really, really good and and ended up pairing up uh, with uh, James Sweet, who directed that. And we're working on a thing called uh, The Diary of Pamela Voorhees that you know we have done and again we're waiting to see what the outcome of all this stuff is right. going to be but yeah that just the whole thing of these movies have a whole life of their own a whole fandom that that just goes on and on and on you know for decades that is is incredible but at these conventions we look around and it's almost like the movie freaks where we're all like you know one of us one of us you know or <laughs> we're the, all these geeky people that always were felt like the nerds, the outsiders, and it doesn't matter, you know, if you're gay or straight or skinny or overweight or whatever, we're all one of this melting pot that we're linked together because we love monsters. We love that, that fantasy. We love, I mean, I love feeling empowered as Frankenstein or the Wolfman as a kid, you know, it made you feel like whatever anybody else did, if they knew what I could do at night when I transformed, you know, yep. that, it works. It, it just works as part of the human psyche of, of survival on so many levels. And it's it's shocking when people come over and go, look at here, look at here, there's your movie, right? You know, and they'll have like, you know, Jason hanging or they'll have him in the Tommy and him flight fighting in a boat. And I said, dude, you know, you're going to like go to your grave with that because I'm proud of it, too. You know, <laughs> it's hey, that, you know, I never would have ex expected tattoos, period, in this day and age, much less with movies that you you know you did like on somebody's arm amazing yeah no you you've you've uh 
you've definitely left your mark on on uh on the you know the Friday franchise without a doubt whether it's it's part six vengeance vengeance two um mm-hmm. I mean you've you've definitely uh, I mean even one dark night I mean again it's it's uh it's a great film you've definitely you know like I said you left your mark man I mean it's it's and it's not going away anytime soon and and like we were talking um you know the whole streaming thing it's nice but you know i i went out and i you know bought the box set or the blu-rays when they came out i'm like you know streaming's cool but eventually somebody's gonna get greedy yanked shit off whatever whatever but it's never gonna happen because i got them you know and i wish people would think more like it but i love the you know the the way that people can just like you said turn it on go to town you know, you have a 13 year old kid that's, that's on Paramount plus or Netflix. It's like, Hey, a Friday 13th. What, what's that? Never heard of that. And then all of a sudden you find out there's 11 movies. Have fun kid. Yeah, I know. But I got to tell you one thing though. It's like, as I was doing all these conventions over the years, I started to go, I don't want to keep talking about shit. I did 30 something years ago. I want to do something now. And you know, when I kind of left making movies, it was because I got kind of into the track of doing TV movies. And but I was doing, you know, my monsters were very different. My monsters were, you know, the DC sniper, you know, uh, yes. Corey Dan, who, mm-hmm. who, you know, went into the school and shot up these children that Valerie Bertinelli played. Um, and that was great because I had seven years of having Eddie Van Halen as a best friend. And we shared Christmases together with, with these guys and Halloween. They always came to our house because we, you know, they couldn't trick or treat up in Coldwater Canyon, but they could in Glendale. And it was just an incredible bonding. And don't get me into when he died, what happened to me? I mean, I was a basket case. Oh, sure. but, um, you know, doing those kinds of movies taught me about real life monsters and real life issues, you know, cyber bullying and, you know, uh, a 14 year old starting to get porn on his phone that he can watch, you know, in class and then at home, stay up all night drinking Red Bulls and just watching stuff and going further and further down the track. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of stuff that was just really like, you're gonna make a movie about that. It's like, yeah, but at the same time, it's a, it's a way of saying, you know, this goes on too. And there's a lot of, aberrant behavior that comes out of stuff that you don't realize how easily accessible it is and it it, then it gets down to the whole censorship thing and at what age and stuff but i really kept going back to this thing where for the last 30 something years people said when are you going to make another one and i said if i could think of something that i thought was really worth me going back into it i would and i just nothing came up Frank wanted me to do it right after Jason lives. He wanted me to do Freddie and, and Jason. New Line wouldn't give up the rights. So I half jokingly said, but I would have done it if he said yes, you know, <laughs> Cheech and Chong meet Jason, because I thought this could be a, a whole different breakout in terms of comedy and horror. Yep. But he could not, he mm-hmm. could see what I did with Jason, Jason lives, but mm-hmm. he could not see that, you know, hey, Jason's out here, man. You know, who's that? You know, right. fucking Jason. You know, and just I would have watched it. I would damn right. Yeah. I <laughs> and I was, I'm going to be frank. We all smoke the same weed, man. You know, they all drink the same ripple. You know, when that audience comes in there, they're gonna be on that same, you know, same level. They're gonna yeah. love the horror stuff and the comedy's gonna work. And you're not you know they're not gonna kill Cheech and Chan, but maybe there'd be some where they exchange heads with uh, each other or something. I don't know what you go, how far you want to go, but I think it could be a lot of fun and it just, nope, didn't see it. So I, you know, took off and said, all right, well, when I come up with a good idea and it literally was like five years ago or so, four years ago, you know, I came up with this notion of, wait a minute, there's an element in mind that people always ask you me about that. I always thought I could take that one idea that was in Jason lives and move it out and continue it. And I thought, you know, Everybody says the same thing. The 80s and 90s, that period, I love the way people dress. I love the look of the film and stuff. And I thought, okay, what if I said it 13 years after I put Jason under there? And what if it's a bunch of girls, all female cast, that are in a camp literally across the lake, which is a religious camp, you know, that is literally Camp Christian Lake. And they are staying in this retreat with an Irish nun who is like the nuns I had in Catholic school was a killer. I mean, she beat the shit. I mean, I write with my right hand now because I used to write with my left, but she put 
you know, a pencil in my arm every time I use my right. I still got the scars in Holy there. Holy shit. So they're, they were badass, you know. So they're in there, and it is the, it is the uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, the weekend of Thanksgiving. So they arrive on a Wednesday. Next day is going to be, you know, the Thanksgiving holiday. And, you know, into the weekend, and they have the spiritual retreat. And these are all badass girls. These are girls that are you know, chronic masturbators. These are girls that sell weed. These are girls that are prostitutes on, you know, their weekends. All of these sins that they needed to atone for. And through this incredible opening, Jason comes up out of frozen Crystal Lake. And, you know, and he, all he knows is he has another agenda, which is tied into the earlier movie. These girls have never heard of Jason. It's not like they're savvy like the other ones. They came from another state. They had to go to this camp because the, their other one was closed. They're snowed in. So it's like Carpenter's the thing. There's no place really to escape to. And they're going to give him one hell of a fight, you know, before they're going down with this, you know, really funky looking dude that has been down there for 13 years. And of course, things start to freeze. And, you know, but that doesn't, of course, stop Jason. So I thought the combination of all that would be something we hadn't seen before and i wrote it yeah. literally like i'm in the audience watching this thing and trying to you know if i'm a fan what would i yeah. want to see kind of thing and so i was very excited but of course as soon as i put it out there warner brothers <laughs> new line nobody would even look at it longhouse no 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 you know the rights can't do anything about it so i've got that sitting there you know kind of waiting for that moment when you know, somebody will, will look at it when we know what's happening. And it's, you know, it's so frustrating because people go, wait a minute, you did this other one. Would they want that? And I go, I don't know. I mean, it seems like if they have an agenda that's very silent, you know, very secretive, what's going on there. Mm -hmm. And of course, Sean would be, have to be the one that would do it because he has the mask, Jason. Yep. And Victor has, you know, the uh, young Jason and the mother. And I think the camp and... um her face uh the, the final girl in the uh, adrian adrian king oh oh uh alice alice, alice. and uh, i think that that's it so he can remake it mm -hmm. you know or whatever but it's got to be within that so when i talked to um uh james uh, sweet about this idea because he had thought about making you know the, from the day jason was born i went there is something that if we really can get in the head of Pamela and do a Jason film that's not a Jason film, yet it's at the end of it, you go, that's why he's the way he is, you know. And Pamela, of course, is the is the one, but it's out of love. I mean, this is about protecting this horrible looking kid who's mentally challenged and people can't help but stare or say something or whatever. So the body count starts happening. She's got to keep on the move. And this relationship is certainly not quite, you know, Mrs. Bates and Norman, mm -hmm. but it is kind of in that league that as it goes on, the characters and things that come in, it could be a series, it certainly could be eight, you know, like an ex extended movie, like as we see on Netflix and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I thought, yeah. you know, if we make it longer, it is going to feel like no other Friday. And if somebody says, oh, what is this thing of uh, Diary of Pamela Voorhees? Oh, check it out. Because when it ends, the next thing you need to do is watch the first Friday the 13th yep. uh, and could take you right into it there. But if you never saw any of the Fridays or, you know, Freddy's or <laughs> doesn't know, matter. Like, it doesn't matter. It still works as a horror thriller, basically female serial killer, killer in the late 40s, early 50s that were doing this these horrendous deaths. Because as you look at the first one, she really, you know, did horrific things to these guys. Oh, yeah. And where did that come from? Is that just a mom pissed off? Well, I want to show, yeah, and years of it building and building and what happened to Jason and what he does in that course of events. So that's a Victor thing. And I've been trying to talk to him about it, but he's in that same thing. I can't talk about you know, the, the layers work out all this stuff. So I have these two projects because I want to, you know, do another one in a way that you've not seen before. And people say, why are you talking about it? people going to steal the idea? And I go, you know, at this point, I just want people to hear it. And yep. maybe somebody will say, hey, I heard a really great thing. You know, because the work's done. It's just a question of, you know, getting it to the people who have the rights and they've got to decide how much money, you know, Sean's going to get if Victor does it and how much 
when he Victor's mm-hmm. going to get if Sean does it, and that that's where I think the problem is right now. Yeah, yeah. I know. That, I know that just hit a resolution not that long ago, where you know, like you said, Sean's got some, Victor's got some. Um, you know, it it, it just makes it really murky. Yeah, you know, well, but it, like technically, it's like if if Victor gets the okay, and he can going to make it, he can only release it in the United States. If they want to go, you know, you know, international with it. Sean's got those rights. Wow. So wow. he's got to let that go to some particular tune, yep. you know, um, and vice versa. There's something, I, I think just something in the fact that Victor was the writer on the script that he still has to okay something that Sean wants to do. And they've got really high powered lawyers. Yeah. No know? kidding. No kidding. Yeah. Well, both your ideas we're going to steal. We're going to make those movies <laughs> and, and we'll let you know when we do that. Now, okay. um, you know, I know, I know you said you had a, a party to go to. We don't want to keep you on here too, too long. Um, damn, this has been absolutely incredible. And I knew it was going to be, that's why we scheduled it. Like we did make sure that we got the best of you, best of us. Um, I appreciate that. It's been absolutely phenomenal. Um, Thank you. Clint, Usually okay. does our little thing with our social media. I will let him do our thing. Mm-hmm. Clint, the floor. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, uh, typically we like to we like to plug the people who come on. So we'll we'll definitely um, keep an eye on your social media and make sure that we share a few things on the group because we want people to be uh, uh, up to date on what you got going on. We're huge fans of uh, of the what you've done in the past and of course the vengeance movies and i i just love the death that you've got music on the soundtracks of, of both those films that was uh, really cool um and um so um i don't know if there's anything else that you want to add to it if there if there's anything that you want people to keep an eye on you know to follow you other than uh, your facebook page and your instagram stuff instagram yeah facebook because uh you know tommy mclaughlin you know dot whatever it is dot net not facebook i don't know what is it dot something <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. um but yeah the, you know lots of times that fills up and then i have to kind of go through and see like who's deceased now or what what's happened because you know you kind of bring bring the number down to get more people in um and then yeah the uh i've i've at the moment i've gotten involved with another band called uh mojo 66 and basically we're just doing only like the great cool songs from 1966, which there were a ton of them. I, I was gonna say, well, that's like fucking like a million. It, it, you know, there were so many changes that went on in that time, and of course, I was 16, and so I was like in the middle of playing a lot of those. Most of them, you know, the British R and B stuff is where we really focused on sloths and stuff. But you know, I forgot about all the other things that are also just very really cool. So I'm working on that, and I've got another band called Horror Rocks, which is all the songs from horror movies of which there's a ton and just doing all that heavy metal stuff, you know, sympathy from the devil, obviously killer clowns from outer space. I mean, again, all these things, which I would love to be doing at conventions. Um, you know, it's like their Saturday night VIP party and things. Mm-hmm. So I'm slowly trying to, you know, make that happen and figure out how we can do it so that it's affordable to fly the, you know, the guys in, not yep. all the equipment, we'd have to rent that. But again, it's one of those ideas. I just not ready to give up. Um, in any way, shape, or form, and I have a crypt with my name on it, with instructions of what to do after I'm gone. So the show goes on afterwards, boys. I mean, once I'm in that crypt, people come, they get put their good vibes or whatever there. I'm shoving a yeah. fucking stake in your chest, bringing you oh, yeah. back. <laughs> I, you know, I'm talking about another realm of ghosts. I'm talking about the energy that we leave behind. And my feeling is, why leave it in Grandma's house? You know, like Grandma does. So you go over there and it's like, yeah, I can, I can, I can feel her. You know, right? Putting it right in front of my crypt, so that if you want to come and visit, and you open your heart, and close your eyes, maybe you might hear something. Me playing harmonica as I do there, maybe you'll, you know, sense something. You know, feel something god knows smell something i don't know but uh, you know that it's that idea that if you get two people believing you know in something there's a there's an energy that happens and i don't i I can't explain it i've seen enough ghost things in my life to go all right there's a science here that we just haven't been able to figure out and i would really love after i'm gone and i have no idea what's going to happen <laughs> with things right now knowing there's something where i can say yeah it ain't over when it's you know when you think it's over that it, it goes on so 
see what happens, you know? Absolutely. Oh yeah. Amazing. Absolutely. Brother. Bad. I mean, madness guys, but oh. that's, that's what the industry is about. Right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Putting your head in another place and going, yeah, that's not so bad. Like I told you, I'm just going to shove a metal fucking stake in you, and I'm just going to be like, Ken, oh, <laughs> here we go. Thunderstorm. Yes. I'm going to go, I'm going to go, dude, this is metal. Where's the wood? Yeah. You know, <laughs> go, go cut yourself some wood. Come back here. Uh, Tom, man, thank you. Thank you so much, man. Mm -hmm. um, sure. It has been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Um, thank and you. I, I really, and I, I, I don't have words enough to thank you. I really don't. You're an awesome human being everything you've done, everything you're going to do, um, man, just, uh, just keep doing what you're doing. Cause you, you do a lot of good shit. You do, do a lot of good stuff. So thank you. Yeah. It's been amazing to talk to you. Thank you so much for yes. coming on here. You guys, and all you guys hold on to your dreams. You know, you don't know when they're going to happen. I got to go back and do rock and roll when I was 60. They said, forget about it. I'm going, Hey, I'm enjoying this and having more energy I ever did at 16. So again, whatever it is you love, it, it can happen if you just don't give up that dream absolutely all right Beautiful. brother man thank all you right, so man. much okay we'll holler at you Take later care. you too Bye.